Catholic History Trek, a podcast exploring the Catholic past. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. This prayer that my son just sprinted through is perhaps the best known and most universally prayed of all Catholic prayers. It is the Lord's Prayer. It's also commonly called the Pater Noster, and in English, the Our Father, taken from the first two words of the prayer. Chances are you've heard this prayer, and perhaps many times, and it's quite possible you've heard a different version of this prayer, with an extra line added at the end. So, where does this prayer come from? And when did this extra line show up? And why? And how is this prayer used by the earliest Christians? This is Scott Schulze, and I'll attempt to answer these questions as we trek through the history of the Lord's Prayer. This prayer earns its title as the Lord's Prayer because this was the prayer given to us by our Lord Jesus Christ himself when the apostles asked him to teach them how to pray. And thus, the prayer has been part of the Catholic Church since the very beginning. The Bible records this account in two different locations. One of these is found in the beginning of the 11th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, where we read, And it came to pass that as he was in a certain place praying, when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. The second account of this prayer comes from the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 6, where it says, Thus therefore shall you pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our super substantial bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. These Bible verses I recited come from the Douay Reims version of the Bible. There are various translational differences depending on which translation of the Bible you use. Forgive us our debts can be rendered as forgive us our trespasses or forgive us our sins, as these debts are those owed to God for the sins we have committed. But the most interesting translational note is this super substantial bread mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew. Typically, you don't hear anyone say super substantial when praying the Lord's Prayer. So where does this word come from? When St. Jerome translated the Bible from the original Hebrew, Greek, and Latin languages to form the official Latin Vulgate Bible, in both the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew, he found himself dealing with an enigmatic Greek word, epiousius. This word is used nowhere else in the Greek version in the New Testament, nor in the Greek Septuagint in the Bible. In fact, it's been suggested that Epiousius exists nowhere else in Greek literature, outside of the Greek rendering of the Lord's Prayer in the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew, and the Didache, which is an apostolic catechism from about the year 100 AD. The Greek root words are epi, meaning above or super, and ousia, meaning being, essence, or substance. Even the early church fathers, who mostly all spoke Greek as a native language, were not of unanimous consent on the translation of the word epiousius. St. John Chrysostom held the minority position that it was asking us to only give what was necessary or sufficient for the day, hearkening to the idea of seeking only what was necessary for the day and not desiring to store up an abundance of what can be destroyed. We see this with the Hebrews who try to store up the extra manna on their journey to the promised land. While the majority position held by St. Cyprian, Origen, and other church fathers is that the superstantial bread is the bread of life, or the Eucharist. St. Jerome offered a couple opinions, one, that it is the bread for tomorrow, and two, that it is this Eucharist. As he shows us in his commentary on the Gospel of St. Matthew, where he writes, we can understand supersubstantial bread as the bread that is above all substances and surpasses all creatures. When it came to providing the Latin Vulgate translation of Epiousius, he seemingly decided to hedge his bets and use two translations. In the Gospel of Luke, 
St. Jerome translated it as, Give us this day our daily bread, appearing in the Latin Vulgate as, Panem nostrum quotidianum danobis hodie, and in the Gospel of Matthew, he used, Give us this day our super substantial bread, appearing in the Latin Vulgate as, Panem nostrum super substantialum danobis hodie. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 2837, several meanings of epiousius are provided. A temporal sense to trust without reservation, a qualitative sense of what is necessary for life, a literal sense in the bread of life or Eucharist, and a call to celebrate the Eucharistic liturgy daily. Interestingly, the Latin version of the Lord's Prayer, or the Oratio Dominica, used the Latin Vulgate words from St. Matthew's Gospel, except for the translation of Epiousius, where it uses quotidianum, meaning daily, instead of supersubstantialum, meaning supersubstantial. Regardless of how one translates Epiousius, both Gospels end the Lord's Prayer with the line, sed libro nos amalo, meaning, but deliver us from evil. What is not present in the Latin Vulgate is the extra line used by many Protestants when reciting the Lord's Prayer. This additional bit is, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. So, why do Protestants, who claim to adhere to sola scriptura, add this non-scriptural line, properly called a doxology, to the prayer? And if it's not found in the original Gospel of Luke or Gospel of Matthew, where did this extra line come from? From the earliest days of the Church, the Lord's Prayer has been prayed at the Mass. And for more on the history of the Mass, be sure to check out our Catholic History Trek episode on that topic. When the Lord's Prayer was prayed at the Mass, this doxology, which can be found dating back as far as the Didache, was often said after the Lord's Prayer. This is a practice even seen today in the Novus Ordo Mise, or the new Mass of Pope Paul VI, the Mass which changed the language of the Mass from Latin to the vernacular, which most Catholics are familiar with today. After the Lord's Prayer, the priest offers a prayer beginning, Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, after which the people in the congregation respond with the doxology, For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Early church fathers who wrote about the Lord's Prayer include St. Ambrose and his commentary on the sacraments, St. Augustine, and later Pope St. Gregory the Great, who all mentioned the Lord's Prayer, but none of them considered this non-scriptural doxology to be part of the prayer. Over time, it seems that scriptural copyists who were familiar with saying the doxology after the Lord's Prayer at Mass would sometimes erroneously attach the doxology into scripture itself after the Lord's Prayer. While official Catholic Bibles never accepted this addition, it did show up in some Protestant versions. Today, most Protestant versions have either omitted the doxology from the scriptural text or relegated it to a footnote, remarking it was a later addition to the gospel. I looked at some modern Protestant Bible translations and found that these versions have removed the doxology as part of the scriptural text. The contemporary English version, the Darby Standard, the English Standard Version, the New American Standard Bible, the New International Version, the New Living Translation, and the Wycliffe Bible. While these translations include it in the text, the 1599 Geneva Bible, the Amplified Bible, and most notably, the various versions of the King James Bible, or KJV. And speaking of English kings, in 1541, King Henry VIII, after breaking away from the Catholic Church, issued an edict commanding, His grace perceiving now the great diversity of the translations of prayers hath caused a uniform translation of the said pater noster, ave, creed, etc., to be set forth, willing all his loving subjects to learn and use the same and straightly commanding all parsons, vicars, and curates to read and teach the same to their parishioners. Interestingly, though, this English version of the Lord's Prayer, promulgated by Henry VIII throughout the English-speaking world, did not include the doxology. But later, during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, the English version of the Lord's Prayer was changed to include the doxology. As she ramped up her persecution of Catholics and purged England of any and all Catholic vestiges, adding the doxology to the Lord's Prayer was a simple way to distinguish her official Protestant version from the traditional Catholic version, which did not include the addition of the doxology. Her addition of the doxology into the English renditions of the prayer 
has remained the norm for most Protestants over the past 400 years, and less than a decade after her death, the King James Version of the Bible, from its first appearance in 1611 and onward, has been printed with the doxology included as part of the scriptural text. Kevin and I typically close our Catholic History Trek episodes with the Glory Be, prayed in the Church's historic language of Latin. But this episode was covering the Oratio Dominica, or Lord's Prayer, so do I make sense to end with this Lord's Prayer, also called the Pater Noster, or Our Father. And while the Didache commends the Lord's Prayer to be recited three times during the day, a practice still in place for those who practice the canonical hours, or Liturgy of the Hours, which we do have an episode on that coming up, by the way, the Liturgy of the Hours has this prayer prayed at the Mass, at Lauds, and at Vespers. But I'll end this episode of Catholic History Trek with just one recitation of the prayer. Pater Noster, qui es in celis, sanctificator nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in celo et in terra, panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis hodie, et dimitte nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimittimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos amalo. Amen. Thank you for listening to Catholic History Trek. You can reach us at catholichistorytrek at gmail.com.